Hi everybody uh, and welcome to our webinar on gender inequalities in social protection, people, households and climate adaptation. We're really excited to have so many of you joining us today and I hope it's going to be a really uh, fruitful conversation. So I'm Susanna Fisher. I'm going to be chairing us for today and helping uh, the panelists uh, manage this uh, new online format. Um, so we're really excited to have all of you and would love to have as much interaction as we can. Uh, our format for today is we've got four really uh, exciting speakers who talk about their work. We've got Jana, Sheikh, Simon and Tracy. And I'll talk a little bit more about them um, as we go on to hear from them. So the format is going to be, we're going to hear first from Tracy and then Jana, and their presentations will go back to back. And then we will have a short time to have direct questions and clarifications on their presentations. We will then go on to hear from Simon and Sheikh, and again, we will have a specific time for questions and clarifications. And then in the last part of the session, we're going to try and have a little bit more interaction to hear from you where we can to generate ideas that will really help inform the work that IID is doing around social protection and gender equality, uh, and also to allow as much as possible a fruitful discussion between panelists and between your ideas, um, those of you who are attending today. So I think that we are ready to hear from our first two speakers. So let me introduce them. Firstly, we're going to hear from Tracy Kajumba, who's a principal researcher at IIED. She's worked uh, previously as a gender and climate advisor with Care International, done gender research with the African Climate Change Resilience Alliance, and worked on the integration of climate change into social protection policies and programs in sub-Saharan Africa, while working for the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So she's bringing a real great wealth of experience in practical understanding of how gender equality and social protection issues work together. So she's going to give us an overview of gender equality and social protection and how social protection can be gender transformative. We're then going to hear from J Jana Tenzing, who's a member of the Climate Change Group at IID. And she's also part of the London School of Economics Department of Geography, as well as the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, where most of her research is on social protection. So she will provide us with an overview of how social protection is adapting to climate change and how we can ensure this process takes into account gender equality. So without further ado, Tracy, could I ask you to start us off? Thanks, Susanna. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure my slides can be seen. So um, I've been asked to give an introduction on gender equality and social protection. Uh, social protection is one of those platforms that can be very supportive of uh, integration of gender equality. Uh, first of all, gender equality defines the social roles, rights and responsibilities of men, women, boys and girls in relation to each other. So this significantly has implications on how individuals capabilities can contend with risks. And then we also know that most of the categories targeted for social protection are those that are vulnerable due to multidimensional issues. And uh, we know that the levels of risk and shocks are increasing as a result of climate change, natural disasters, economic issues like food crisis, and others, conflict migration, and many others. So, uh, based on the livelihoods, age, gender, and other categorization, men, women, boys, and girls get impacted differently, and therefore the targeting can be very useful in addressing some of the issues uh, that come up within the social protection programs. But I also want to emphasize that women naturally take major responsibilities for social protection, whether it's supported or not, uh, taking care of the old people, the sick and everything. It's sort of naturally uh, an assigned role. So all these vulnerabilities make it very difficult for them. And mapping social protection across the SDGs, uh, the studies that have been done looking at the impact of social protection are linked to about 14 SDGs. If social protection is well done and uh, well programmed, it has capacity to er eradicate income poverty, uh, reduction of income inequalities, ending hunger, 
improving lives, education, gender equality, access to social services, employment in some of the schemes where we've seen that they are targeting employment, addressing social inclusion, social cohesion, state building, and promoting sustainable consumption and production patterns, which can also be positive for climate change adaptation. Uh, in terms of social protection and gender equality, uh, there's evidence from development context that suggests that if it's done systematically and a gender lens is applied, it can have very positive outcomes in addressing food security. And if we relate this to the gender roles, we'll find that that would be productive for especially women and girls who have those roles of providing at household level. It can improve productive investment and livelihoods. Uh, we see uh, women coming in and getting some capital to invest in other community groups and other economic activities, enhancing capacity to manage the life cycles of risks, smoothing consumption, and ultimately contributing to getting people out of poverty. But it has also been found out that programs that tackle women's related issues that would otherwise keep them out of employment or others uh, gainful employment, uh, things like age, work-related vulnerabilities, childcare, have proven to be effective in terms of addressing inequality. And then also the cash transfers uh, have also been seen to be better at providing assets for women than other schemes like maybe employment schemes and all, especially if they're supported with how investments can be done. But as we look at all the benefits of how social protection can promote gender equality, we also need to look at the side of not well done, how it can be counterproductive in addressing such issues. Uh, one of them is that um, we know social protection supports communities, household, and individuals, but there may be some inequalities if especially uh, targeting is focused on the formal sector, where women may not be represented, it could be one-sided, or where they're underrepresented. So it could be a result of uh, in increasing inequality. Then when you look at the issues of intra-household relations, sometimes when women get income, that can result into a uh, power balance at household level, where the men may feel the women have money, now they should take over everything. And because they are controlling resources, that may not turn out well for them if uh, the, the awareness is not created. Then the conditional transfers, sometimes also the conditionalities may act as a burden of having multiple expectations placed on women. Uh, since they have this, then definitely they should do everything. Uh, and also women being principal beneficiaries that not really mean that the decision making is happening within the households. Uh, we've had cases where women uh, get funding from uh, different social protection schemes, but then they are not able to control the outcomes of uh, how those funds get invested. And most times we have a narrow focus on women where we translate gender to mean women and we exclude the men. So we find that we, we assess impact as women benefiting within the bigger framework, but in actual sense, um, we are not really transforming their conditions because they experience other forms of lashback afterwards. So we need to look at both uh, men, women, boys and girls and how they are benefiting and in terms of their roles and uh, vulnerabilities. So in answering the question of how social protection can be transformative, um, one of the things that we need coherence in policy, knowing that social protection is just part of the solution. There have been uh, arguments of the note of a burden social protection because it's also still growing. And if you add in so many things, it will not work. But we find that gender equality lens is a way that is very suitable in terms of targeting and others. But then we, look, we need to look at other government programs, other institutional programs to see how they address gender inequality and how do you bring everything together and intentionally design them at uh, policies, implementation, monitoring, evaluation so that we avoid the siloed approaches. Because if we focus on social protection in isolation, then it becomes difficult to achieve uh, transformation in a meaningful way.
Uh, the other area to look at would be targeting, which should be based on gender and vulnerability to ensure that usually the groups that are not normally targeted in a meaningful way are now supported. Uh, most times uh, the people that should be in the social protection are the very poor, maybe migrants, those affected by disasters, but most of the times uh, are left out. That should really be transformative so that we are responding to their needs. Uh, doing a gender analysis would be very important to look at the specific vulnerabilities, the needs, the gender differentiated impacts that they're experiencing, so that we are able to tackle the underlying causes of vulnerability, which could be maybe governance or policies, or understanding the causes of risks and shocks, having uh, climate information, for example, so that we are not just programming, but we know that this area is uh, risky and the people living there experiencing this and that, and then we need to be able to target them meaningfully and informed by the needs um, that they think would lead them to a more effective and transformative uh, way. Uh, then supporting and valuing care roles for women uh, is important, especially uh, in, in the public works uh, modes of social protection. Sometimes affirmative action may be required. Uh, I've seen programs whereby men and women are all working on public works, then we, a woman gets pregnant and then she's breastfeeding and then she has other children at home. Uh, and the programs have really tried to address those with flexible hours, sex quarters and governance structures. And those can make sure that there's no exclusion and everybody's benefiting but also valuing the unpaid roles that women are involved in so that they are not excluded from development programs. Empowerment uh, is important, so economic empowerment, voice, participation, decision-making, uh, looking at it from the rights perspective, uh, so the very poor and vulnerable are able to engage, and this would be able to enhance their agency. Then, uh, in terms of monitoring and evaluation, we need to capture the, the impacts, the benefits, uh, the data should be in a disaggregated manner. Instead of saying social protection is beneficial, but for who are we able to analyze the benefits for women, for men, and the challenges so that they're able to inform programs and we're able to challenge uh, some of the approaches that are not working. Yeah, thanks, Susanna. I will stop there. Thanks, Tracy. So we're going to move straight on to Jana. Hi, everyone. I'm just uh, I'm just going to jump right in and pick up from where Tracy left off. So social protection is um, absolutely essential for managing climate risks. Um, in the short term, instruments such as cash transfers can support coping with climate change, helping households to meet their most acute and immediate needs as well as access extra resources if there's a shock. And in the aftermath, this predictable support can help households build their asset base and thus support recovery. Um, and in the longer term, though we should be careful not to overstate this potential, social protection can um, promote or facilitate livelihood changes that enable people to better anticipate or adapt to climate change. So in the past decade, there's been growing interest among policymakers and practitioners in bringing social protection and adaptation together around such concepts as adaptive or climate responsive social protection. Um, and this agenda is still evolving, but essentially it's about making social protection programs flexible so that they are better able to respond to climate impacts. And by doing so, they can also build the resilience of their beneficiaries at the same time as providing social protection. So it's been <clears throat> influenced a great deal by advocates of shock responsive social protection, which extends beyond climate change considerations into all kinds of other covariate shocks, which are um, shocks that affect uh, large groups of people at the same time. In general, when people talk about making social protection adaptive, they're talking uh, about introducing additional features to the design of existing programs. So um, ideas converge around the need for strengthening climate information systems to plan for and deliver social protection, um, being able to rapidly increase the level of, 
of support to recipients as well as the number of people social protection can cover in order to deal with climate shocks. There are ideas around putting in place appropriate finance mechanisms to rapidly scale up programs, such as setting up contingency funds or um, forecast-based financing mechanisms. Um, and then um, enhancing institutional capacity and coordination among the wide range of stakeholders involved in the delivery of social protection. Um, and here are some suggestions for how to ensure that in the process of making social protection programs adaptive, we can continue to take into account gender, uh, of gender equality considerations. So for planning and implementation, for instance, we need to make sure that we are informed by sex disaggregated data, statistics, and evidence in order to understand the differentiated needs, vulnerabilities, and experiences of women and men, and ensure that they are equally involved in decision-making processes and have equal access to information, for instance. Um, if we're thinking of expanding support horizontally, we need to think deliberately about access and targeting. And if women are being targeted for the provision of increased support, as social protection programs often do, then complementary measures such as sensitization of communities and households could be necessary to avoid any backlash on women. Um, in terms of finance, purposely budgeting for gender equality actions is always important. And if mechanisms like forecast-based financing are being used, then conducting gender sensitive climate risk assessments would also be key. And finally, it's important to think about training on gender equality for implementing staff across sectors, as well as partnering with women's organizations who have specialist knowledge and networks um, and gender sensitive M&E as um, Tracy has just explained. To give you an example, um, Ethiopia's flagship productive safety nets program, the PSNP, um, even though it was not originally conceived as such, could be considered um, an adaptive social protection program. So it supports around 8 million people and was set up to address food insecurity in rural Ethiopia, which is um, for the most part drought related food insecurity. Um, it has three components, um, and I'll focus only on the first two today. So the, the main one is a workfare component, where about 80% of PSNP households are engaged in public works in exchange for cash and food transfers. And if, household, if, if a household is physically unable to participate in the public works, then it can receive direct, unconditional support. For example, um, uh, households with elderly or disabled people. There are uh, ongoing efforts to make these public works climate smart wherever possible. So one of the main activities undertaken, for instance, is um, watershed development and rehabilitation and other conservation measures, which not only aim to increase PSNP participants' resilience to drought, but also that of the entire communities in that watershed. Um, and it, in addition to this, the PSNP also has a built-in risk financing mechanism that allows for support to be scaled up or scaled out to non-PSNP households in the event of a major shock. So how is the PSNP doing on gender? Um, well, there is a gender equity principle that is enshrined within its implementation manual to ensure that women and men benefit equally from the program. Um, and for instance, there are provisions for pregnant women and lactating women to temporarily shift out of the public works into the direct support program for up to a year after giving birth to their child. Um, there are also provisions for public works to be gender sensitive, um, designed in ways that ensure women can participate without increasing their work burdens, uh, like accommodating lighter workloads, different arrival and departure times, locations closer to home, and so on. Um, so I think these provisions are commendable, but of course, it's what happens in practice that matters, which I can speak less to, but I know that there are some studies that have found public works can have a negative impact uh, on women in certain cases, and maybe we can discuss this um, later. So just some final thoughts before I hand back over to Susanna. Um, I think that using a gender lens allows us to think critically about the adaptive social protection agenda. So if we want to ensure that social protection considers gender equality, then we're very much thinking of 
women and men as having equal rights to social protection. And we're underlining that social protection needs to have a kind of transformative function that addresses inequality and marginalization. So I think that no one denies that adaptive social protection makes conceptual sense in terms of aiming to maximize development and co-benefits. But um, in contexts where resources and capacity are limited, um, is there a risk that we are diverting attention away from work towards achieving social protection's core poverty and vulnerability reduction objectives, which is in any case contributing to adaptation and building resilience? Um, so basically, this is to underline that what many others have also said, which is that we must be careful not to focus prematurely on how to make programs adaptive and that it's so important to get the basics of social protection rights and that includes paying attention to gender equality. So that's it for me and I can hand back over to you. Great, thanks Jenna. So um, we're going to use the Q&A function now just to get any clarifications or to learn a little bit more about what Tracy and Jana have presented. So if you have specific questions for either of them, could you please put it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen? And I've got one question there that I'm going to start off with. So this is from Teresa who says, could someone provide a definition of social protection? And if there are different ways to define it or classify it in the literature or within our sector? Um, Jana, would you like to pick that one up first? Uh, yes, so I think there are many ways to define social protection and I think it's a really good question to ask. Um, so social protection, usually when people are talking about it in an international development context, uh, we tend to talk about um, safety nets like cash transfers or food transfers um, that can support um, households, usually uh, the poorest households determined by some kind of poverty line um, to cope with, with shocks on their livelihoods. Um, social protection can of course extend beyond these kinds of cash and food transfers. So um, it can include insurance mechanisms or labor market programs, which are more common in more uh, higher income country contexts. And of course, it can also in include informal um, types of social protection, um, like um, you know, just the, the, the type of social protection that you get from your community or your family or your friends and your neighbors. I mean, something that occurred to me on hearing both of your presentations, and I wonder if you could reflect on this, Tracy, was how, um, what kind of institutional capacities are needed for a social protection program to be able to move to the next stage to, um, you know, think about adaptive measures or gender equality? Because Jana talked about the importance of getting the basics right. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me posed the question of, well, when, what capacities do we need to look in place to have the basics right, but then to be able to take those next steps that you're both talking about? Uh, thank you, Susanna. Just like I said, um, the basics are important, but then that has to fit in the whole institutional framework, especially the policy and implementation. And uh, sometimes we are talking about adaptive social protection. We are talking about gender equality. This is a set of different skills that you don't find in one place. Uh, somebody may be very good at social protection or climate change, but are not don't have the right skills to integrate gender equality. So the coherence across uh, institutions that are supporting social protection is important so that the gender experts, the climate experts, and the social protection basic exp expertise all joins together to make sure that there is a good program that can really be adaptive, uh, which sometimes is really a challenge. And then also, as Jenna said, you find there's support through humanitarian response, through social protection instruments. And different institutions are supporting, government is supporting different donors. But how do you bring everything together so that you build on the skills and the support so that communities are able to get a comprehensive package other than just the siloed uh, approach and uh, yeah, support? Thanks, Tracy. So this has given people a little more time for reflection. A couple of questions have come up um, that I think speak to something Jana was talking about. So uh, Andrea Rhoda has asked, 
how do you balance the importance of getting the basics right with the potential of maladaptive trajectories that could be created by social protection? And I think that um, Rajaswari has brought up a similar point in terms of social protection measures often don't meet the needs of the poor. So in, how can they also contribute to adaptation and resilience? So some challenging issues there, Jana, do you have any thoughts? Mm -hmm. So I think um, the point made that social protection measures often do not meet the needs of the poor is a really good one. And I think that's what we mean by needing to get the basic right. So ensuring that um, um, people, the intended beneficiaries of programs are the, the ones being targeted by the program. There's, there are no exclusion errors and inclusion errors. Um, I think um, also related to the, the earlier question by Andrea Ross, the importance of getting the basics right uh, and the potential for irreversible maladaptive traje trajectories. Um, I think that, so I think the problem with the, um, the way that the adaptive social protection agenda is evolving is it's really trying to maximize the, the adaptation um, outcomes of social protection programs. And I think that's different from trying to make sure that that social protection programs are considering future climate change. So in that sense, I think considering future climate change is really important and social protection programs need to make sure that they're not um, locking in uh, vulnerable people in a, in, a, in a vulnerable location, for instance, um, that, that would just have a negative effect on them in the long term. Um, so yeah, I, I think both really important points that people need to grapple with. Thanks, really interesting. So a couple of other questions have come up. Um, something from Rizwana Aga, who's saying that um, their research has shown that sometimes community participation might not accomplish the expected level of social protection because policy guidelines for participatory forums don't address complex issues of hierarchy and local decision making and power. For example, local elites might challenge women's access to decision making. Um, and this, a similar point also commenting around how difficult it is to use these types of participatory methods um, during violent conflicts and how can social protection work within fragile contexts. Um, I wondered, Tracy, did you have any reflections on those? Uh, thanks, Susanna. I would say that um, the same challenges with gender equality, <laughs> I've worked on gender equality for years, and you find the same problems in whatever theme you're looking at, whether social protection, or agriculture, or whatever. So the issue of local decision making and the cultural norms, that, uh, that's what I talked about at the beginning, that sometimes empowering women through social protection, because culturally women are not supposed to control productive resources, may be counterproductive. So that's why um, we need to look at layering it with other ongoing programs and policies and approaches so that if you're not able to do the awareness that includes both men and women on looking at what are the benefits of both men and women participating or local people participating in decision making, then there's another program that is supporting that. Going back to the problem of uh, uh, overburdening social protection by approaching all these things, so that's where we need an integrated approach. If there's a partner who is very good with gender equality, how do you work with them in a social protection program to do that? We used to take that approach in every shade whereby if there's a social protection uh, event going on, then bringing in other partners to speak to the beneficiaries and the local governance leaders about issues of how, of inclusion and integrating other elements into the social protection program. I, I want to say that it's not easy, uh, but different approaches and building on different skills from other partnerships. And then that coherence across would be useful. But yeah, it's, it's not really easy to do that. That's true. Thanks, Tracy. Questions coming in thick and fast now. Um, I think I'll just take one more because we'll then need to move on to our other presenters. And, and some of these questions are broader questions which we'll be able to open out a little bit in the conversation. Um, so, uh, Anna is asking, to what extent do you, either of you feel that the big programs you've discussed are doing enough 
consider enough promotive social protection measures, for example, enabling women to promote in the labour market and reducing employment status and income gaps compared to their peers. Would either of you, Jana, would you like to say anything briefly on that? Um, or Tracy, um, and then we'll move on. So the only thing that I would be able to say is probably it depends on um, wh which measures specifically you're looking at. So the PSNP, for instance, is much more of a, um, a, a safety net um, program which focuses much more on the protective aspect of social protection rather than the promotive. But that being said, it's got a, a livelihoods component, which I didn't speak too much about, which aims to um, help uh, women and men involved in the program to um, uh, develop their asset portfolios in order to um, have more productive uh, livelihoods. So I think it, it really depends on, on which program or measures you're talking about. Uh, just to add on a little bit on what Jenna has shared, um, the social protection program in Tanzania, for example, was designed to support women and youth who from statistics were excluded from gainful employment. And it was focusing on value chains around agricultural value chains and specifically targeting them to, to make sure that they're involved in the value chains, not just at the production nodes, but they're engaged in marketing and uh, improving their incomes through that. So most times it will depend on the instruments that are being used and who is being targeted and for what purpose to be able to address some of the issues around employment and gainful income. Great. Okay, I feel like the conversation is just getting started, but we still want to hear from Simon and Sheikh. So thank you very much, Tracy and Jana. We'll be coming back to you soon for the discussion. But now I'd like to move on to hear their presentations from Simon Anderson and Sheikh Eskandar. So Simon Anderson is a senior fellow at IID working on gender equality, learning and social protection. He's the co-chair of IID's Gender Equality Champions Network, and he's been involved in adaptive social protection research since 2011. Uh, working more recently in Mozambique and Ethiopia. And he's going to talk us through some of the work he's been doing with the Priori's, hope I pronounce it right, initiative funded by the Irish Embassy in Mozambique. And we'll then go on directly to hear from Sheikh Eskandar, who's a visiting research fellow at LSE's Grantham Research Institute and a senior lecturer at Kingston University in London. His research is on development issues related to sustainability, environment and climate change economics. And his ongoing research topics include um, triple vulnerability of female entrepreneurs to climate risks, climate finance and work on climate laws and he's going to be talking about work around remittances in Bangladesh, so a more informal mechanism for social protection. Okay, so Simon, could I hand over to you? And just to remind everyone, thank you Simon, that we'll take the Q&As in, in a similar way, so as things to occur to you from Simon and Sheikh's presentations, just put them into the Q&A function. Thank you, Susanna. I hope that everybody can see my screen. Um, and yes, this is a short presentation on some of the things that we have done and found, uh, found out in Mozambique uh, through the Priori's um, initiative. And before I go any further, I want to acknowledge uh, three of the people mentioned on this, this screen who are part of the team, the wider team in Mozambique. And it's really what these people have done and found out that I'm going to describe. So Mel Gomez, Rogerio Sitoli and Luis Atol, uh, colleagues from whom I've learned an awful lot. So if we, if we pick up a little bit where we've left off with the other two presentations, we, we're looking at adaptive social protection um, from the perspective essentially of, of uh, poverty eradication. Of course, local development has a key role in that. And so social protection and local, and local development should be seen as reciprocal parts of the process. However, as we know, climate change risks mean that people both drop into poverty and also find it difficult to escape from it. Climate change risks also uh, impede the effectiveness of of social, de of social development strategies. 
And climate change risks also impede the effectiveness of the provision of social protection. Against those three sources of climate risks and stress, we have processes of adaptation that can be by climate proofing local development. Much of community-based adaptation and local adaptation tries to do this. We also have means of climate proofing the delivery and support um, of social protection and that social protection as Jana has um, already described can support adaptation in some ways but perhaps most importantly we have adaptation by local people who who are in who are benefiting from or in communicate or in communities where social protection is, is is being provided but the adaptation by the poor enabled by the local adaptation the local development planning process is probably the most important in terms of the background to this initiative that I want to talk about, the Irish government has, or the Irish embassy in Mozambique has been working with the government, both the Ministry for Social Action, Gender and Children and the Ministry for, for Environment and Land. Um, and they've been looking at ways where they might combine social protection and climate adaptation and seeking the synergies between two, two instruments that, that, that the same government is utilizing um, up until recently utilizing in parallel and the government was interested to see whether these two instruments adaptation local adaptation and social protection could be brought together so we did a prospective assessment uh, some years ago now this found that yes there was a policy framework that was conducive there were initiatives that the government had up and running that could be brought together but the main conclusion was that the social protection programs, their capacity to take on climate resilience, climate um, adaptive ob objectives wasn't sufficient at that stage <clears throat> to allow either the integration of adaptation or disaster risk management. Um, and, and in fact, we've, you know, on, on top of that, we found that um, the, the current level of social protection programs were, were contributing relatively little to those to those objectives. So the Priorese initiative was initiated, supported by the Irish Embassy, and in a very modest way, um, starting um, uh, our bottom up process based in, in one district, we wanted to experiment in the way, that, in ways that in institutional linkages could be built across um, agencies that were supporting uh, local development um, and um, and social protection in a way that introduced climate adaptive management. Uh, Mabot um, in the province of Inambani was, was chosen. The reason why we chose Mabot is because it is one of the poorest districts of Mozambique. Um, we found that uh, there's a very large proportion of female headed households, over 50%. And most of those are, are, were, cat were in, the, in the poor to very poor category. We also, from the climate information, climate projections information available, we, we saw that there were, there were both current and projected risks, and that these climate risks had a high gender differentiated um, characteristic. You'll see on the, on the graph that shows the um, um, anomalies of, 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 of future rainfall, um, that um, this dry, this already dry area is expected to have e even more erratic and less rain. So we did a gender analysis um, of, of uh, in the district, uh, sampling 33 households. The, the population of the district is about 40, 45,000 people. Um, we found that um, female headed single adult households uh, predominate. Um, these households had certain characteristics um, which, uh, which were both similar to those headed by men and also different. There was 97% uh, of the female headed households are agriculture dependent. Um, these households, female headed households, uh, were tended to be smaller than the male headed households. Uh, the literacy of the ha household head was, was less than the, in the case of male headed. They had less land and they had less livestock, considerably less livestock on average. It was, we also noted through the baseline survey, and this is something related to the targeting of social protection, which is 
which is in, uh, which is we're finding is is common um, that actually the, the the social protection targeting process um, wasn't as effective as it should have been in terms of um, differentiating between households who were who were poor and households who were better off. The average the average for various parameters of social protection recipient households in Marbot was either the same or actually higher than the non social protection recipients in many cases. Um, now, what did we do in this in this in this in this process? Essentially, what we what we've done is to together together with the with the government agencies and the local government authority, uh, we have designed uh, a prototype, which is we would like to think gender responsive ad adaptive social protection. As I've mentioned, we started off with a baseline survey and we did a qualitative appraisal with households. Um, the district developed a climate adaptation plan. This plan was incorporated into the district uh, development plan. And through, and through that process, for the first time in Mozambique, um, uh, there was a special consultation of social protection beneficiaries in the development of the local adaptation plan. Um, as a third step, uh, we agreed participant el eligibility in, in the initiative. Um, and we also were able to identify um, those households eligible to become participants in this adaptive social protection process. Uh, we are now uh, some way into the implementation of the adaptation measures, water access, livelihood activities, capacity development, etc. Um, importantly, there's a local CBO who's involved in the monitoring, evaluation and learning. This evaluation and learning is, it uses sex, sex disaggregated data. Um, and there, 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 uh, there are ongoing and will be further revisions of the district development plan looking at the success of the adaptation uh, measures. So what have we been learning through this process? Well, firstly, uh, the evidence of gender dif differences across households was important and it enabled us to, to validate and to justify a focus on female-headed single adult households. Uh, secondly, women's and men's groups were, was, were consulted um, um, as, 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 as integrated groups, but also as separate groups during, during the, the climate adaptation planning process. And there was a gender analysis of climate risks and adaptation actions. Um, during the, the process of, of uh, um, identifying the households to be participants in the adaptive social protection. We followed the recommendation of the social protection agency, which was a very interesting one. It was to invite social protection eligible households, but not ones who were in receipt of, of social protection at that time. So this was, and this was a strategic suggestion by the, the social protection provision providing uh, agency, actually to expand the numbers of households who were able to, to benefit from the, the formalized social protection and the, the, the local adaptive social protection. Simon, could I just ask you to um, hurry up, move towards an end? Yes, thanks. Yep. <laughs> um, and so this is the the, uh, the just to say that the government targeting process was used to identify these households, and actually it, it had a better result than some of the some of the previous targeting processes. These are just a list of uh, activities, the livelihood activities, and the income generating activities that the households benefited from. As you can see from this, that there was a strong focus on female-headed households. The conclusions I want to bring: one, the demographic patterns demand a gender-responsive approach. The fact we had you know, nearly 55% of households female-headed demanded that we took a gender responsive approach. Working within government guidelines for social protection and adaptation was possible and it actually facilitated the process of inst institutionalization. The fact that we've layered adaptation around social protection provision means that the, the dangers of overburdening the social protection system have been avoided. The management of the adaptation or the adaptive social protection process needs to be evidence-based monitoring, evaluation, learning, but iterative, and prototype testing bottom-up facilitated introduction of the gender-responsive approach. 
We haven't proved that this is adaptive. We need to do a performance assessment of the prototype, normalized for, for climate risks over time. Um, and that's something that is, is happening currently. Um, I just want to pay, some, pay respects to uh, Mr. Avelio Adelaide, who was the administrator in the Mabot district during the process that I've been describing. Unfortunately, he passed away recently. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Fascinating case study. So, Sheikh, could we just move directly on to you, please? Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, gender inequality in climate finance. We uh, using a large household survey data set, we drew some findings from Bangladesh about households burden uh, when exposed to climate risks like uh, natural disasters and other things. So a uh, bit of background, if you can see, uh, multiple stakeholders are actually contributing to climate finance in Bangladesh, including the government of Bangladesh, international donor agencies, but the large or major share of climate finance actually comes from the individual private households then we cannot really blame the government all the time because you can see from this graph from this time series that contributions from public sector is increasing the problem or uh, also there are contributions coming in from donors and specific focus has been given to food security and social protection as you can see from uh, 40 to 60 percent of total public allocations are going to this specific thing. Then again, households are the major contributor, as we found, and we made some calculations when in 2015, the government of Bangladesh contributed uh, something slightly less than 1 billion US dollar. Households actually made their private contribution, something around $2 billion. And the conclusion from these research findings can be, although there are contributions coming in, still huge financial burden, the households are still bearing because of their exposure to climate and disaster risk. That's not the end of the story. If, you, if we look at the income composition by households, uh, uh, gender composition of household headship, like the male headed households who are apparently three times uh, higher income earner are making almost equal contribution to the, uh, when compared to female headed households, but in uh, uh, when compared to in percentage terms, we can see that female-headed households actually make roughly three times higher contribution. And it's not always a good thing because uh, apparently females care more. And that's, if we go back to have another look at the figures, Six or uh, eighteen or nineteen percent of thirty-five uh, thousand Bangladeshi taka, which is roughly say four hundred or four fifty US dollar, is going into climate change adaptation expenditure or related things, and that's a lot of expenditure those female-headed households are incurring because of exposure to this type of risks, and that's affecting their uh, basic or necessary food intakes and also affecting uh, schooling, healthcare, and other necessary services they need to you know, provide to their household members like their dependent children. And in some cases also uh, unemployed and dependent uh, spouses. Another problem that um, we directly or indirectly are talking about, I mean, I am referring to other uh, panelists who presented before me, uh, 
about the source of finance or the sustainability of social protection services and those things. And in case of Bangladesh, we identified briefly three uh, different sources those households, male or female headed, were accessing during uh, hardships and especially during their exposure to uh, natural disasters or climate risks. Uh, the first one you can say microcredit. The advantage, it's uh, primarily accessed by women. The disbursement of money is really fast, but the problems, amounts are small and they come with higher interest rates. And then uh, informal sources can be uh, some kind of informal social protection provided by the local community and extended or close family members. Uh, the problem here is it's primarily accessed by men. The disbursement is first, but it also comes with higher interest rates and sometimes with uh, other conditions. And then formal financial institutions uh, in most of the cases don't really uh, provide loans to women without uh, support or collateral from uh, men and that's a problem and the disbursement is really slow although amounts can be large and interest rates can be low now you can see the gender aspect here we apparently found from our research that women care more they contribute in absolute amount almost the equal amount but when it comes to financing whatever they are contributing or they are bound to contribute um, towards climate finance, the sources are not really favorable to the women. And that's a problem uh, when it comes to financing climate actions by female headed households. The policy recommendations, uh, we actually came up with a couple of uh, qualitative recommendations say during disasters there can be installment breaks and I guess this is something we all or many of us can relate to the ongoing coronavirus uh, situation at this moment we are asking for installment breaks or something like that but it's not really happening and it doesn't really happen all the time when it comes to repaying the money female headed households are borrowing from microcredit organizations during disasters. And then the bottom up approach, hearing uh, the views of the people in the field, especially the females, that's not really happening when making the policies. And I guess probably it came from Tracy. Uh, or Jana, I forgot, say local elites instead of local women actually can influence the policy making and that doesn't necessarily go in favor of female headed households and most of the times actually go against the benefit of female headed households and that's a problem, universal problem and also a problem in Bangladesh. Now from the policy makers or from the government, the issue or action can be to make formal sources of finance first and accessible uh, to women, especially during the disaster. And especially because it's kind of a, a, kind of a long-term uh, planning female headed households can make with the help of uh, formal sources of finance and maybe if those sources can be faster and more accessible to them they also can use those uh, money for immediate coping strategies the final one I guess I already mentioned it fast tracking the loans from formal sources during uh, this type of emergencies and yeah, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Thank you.
Thanks, Sheikh. Thanks very much. So we've already got some questions coming in um, for Simon and Sheikh before we move on to the discussion. So Simon, if we could start with you, um, Emma Jones Philipson is asking, um, you mentioned that social protection was not well means tested and there were implementation issues in eligibility. Did you have any indication of why those issues had arisen that could be additional barriers to adaptation, for example, literacy or access to information? And I'm just going to give you another question at the same time, which I think um, is also around uh, similar issues of targeting. So uh, Shyla is asking, what are the changes in targeting process that you have proposed to make sure that it is gender responsive? Thanks for these, uh, these questions. Um, targeting is um, a hugely sensitive topic, uh, particularly when you're um, from a research perspective where you're looking at uh, the results of uh, formal agencies doing targeting and you come up with evidence as we did in this uh, in the district survey of of Mabot that um, it would appear for, from the from the data that the households targeted which were um, some uh, 2,000 people out of a population of 45,000 um, their average um, well-being levels measured by different parameters was equal to or if not greater than the than the population average which would indicate that the, the targeting mechanism hasn't reached the most poorest. However, um, what we also found out in the same process was that when we did the when we used exactly the same mechanism that government used and with and working alongside government agencies to identify the households that will be part of the adaptive social protection program, uh, the subsequent uh, survey showed that um, using the same process, we were successful in targeting um, a population of female headed households that were on average um, poorer than the, 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 than the population. They, they in fact were within the, the income and, and, and asset levels categories that we wanted to. So um, I'm not able to answer the question as to why the initial targeting in that district uh, wasn't as successful as, the, as when we use the same method uh, subsequently. But what I'm saying is that it, 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 that, is, that is what we found, that is the case. Um, I think we need to be very careful when we assess targeting methods used by governments and particularly where uh, governments are, as in the Mozambican case and there's others in Southern Africa where they use local knowledge and local local people, local leaders to support the system of targeting. Um, we, when we then apply very sort of rigid um, outside uh, assessments of poverty to assess the effectiveness of targeting, um, we fail to understand the logic of the, of the local targeting mechanisms. And there, there, is, there is anecdotal evidence from Malawi, for example, that local leaders target um, households who they believe to have a, um, a, a higher likelihood to contribute to community well-being um, and those are not necessarily the poorest households. So there are, there are, there are, there are, there are ways and means to understand um, targeting effectiveness that need to be that need to be looked into. Um, in terms of answering the question, uh, 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 in t the second question, I think that we are already starting through the process of local adaptation planning in Mozambique to show how um, by consulting groups, by in including gender analysis in both uh, climate risk assessment and adaptation prioritization, you can start to improve um, at least the, the way that households are then um, targeted or invited to participate in the initiative in, in a way that reflects um, properly uh, levels of, of uh, climate vulnerability. So I think there, you know, there are already ways appear, appearing before us that, that, we can, that we can see that will help us get over this, these issues. Great. Thanks, Simon.
Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to now move us on to the interactive session, but um, we'll have a chance to hear more from Sheikh as we go into the discussion as well. So what we want to do before we go on to a broader uh, cross-cutting discussion is just to hear a little bit from you. And that's difficult when there have been 150 of you on the webinar, but um, we're going to try our best. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to take this first question on the left and this would really help us um, and or IID thinking about their work on gender and social protection to tell us a little bit about any examples you have experienced or heard about that successfully incorporate gender dimensions and what we can learn from them and what I'm going to ask you to do is if you have any ideas or thoughts just to write one or two sentences in the chat but don't press send yet so just gather your thoughts let us know of any examples that you've thought of any lessons that that you've read about or experienced that we haven't brought up so far and write it in the chat and then just hold off and we'll just have 30 seconds while everybody writes them and then we'll release it together and we'll just be able to see what other experience we have. Okay, so hopefully you've all had a little time to think about that. So could I ask you all to press send? Either my Zoom chat is a little slow or people are feeling a little shy to come forward with their examples, but we've got some good insights there. Thank you to those of you who have made any suggestions uh, and do just have a look at that on the chat, everybody. So the second thing, um, do plus send if you're writing something. And then the second thing we'd just like to ask you before we go on to the cross-cutting conversation is from hearing our presenters so far, both the detailed examples and also the broader presentations, what barriers and opportunities have you seen through this work in terms of how we might use social protection to support gender equality? So again, if we could take the similar, um, similar approach that you write something in the chat and you just hold it and we'll all press send at the same time and just be able to read through uh, what other people are thinking. And that will hopefully just give us a level of reflection um, across all of these ideas as we move into the discussion. So I'll ask you just to think that to yourself. What have you heard or what's resonated with you around barriers and opportunities? Okay, and if you're ready, then I ask you to press send. So we're seeing some thoughts here around barriers around local elites and politics, around opportunities and scalability, institutional and structural barriers. How do we build buy-in for these conversations? government buy-in also a key issue what are the stigma or obstacles associated with accessing accessing social protection again this issue of barriers for women's decision making what impact can we make with small program designs great okay thank you everybody and if those of you still writing then please do press send so we can uh, have that wider set of ideas so what we're going to move on to now is to have the panel uh, discussion. So I'd maybe recommend that make sure that all panelists please have your videos on. And for attendees, if you use the grid video function, you should be able to see all of the talking heads together to get as much of a sense as possible of us sitting on a comfy sofa around the room at IID having this conversation. So some really interesting questions have already come up um, that I think speak to across the presentation. So I think we might kick start with some of those. So so Emma Jones Phillipson has asked, do the panelists think we, that we should be advocating funds like the Green Climate Fund or the Global Environment Facility should consider funding social protection as adaptation? So I wondered uh, who would like to, to wager in on how we should be financing this. Jana, would you like to start us off? Um, yeah, so I think this is a question that I've been thinking about as well. Um, I think it, it's, <laughs> I think it's more, um, it goes back to the question of development versus adaptation I, um, and whether the climate funds um, would consider um, program, social protection programs uh, as adaptation without having that additional um, um, uh, deliberate um, uh, way to respond to climate hazards. So I think that just social protection in, its, in itself does contribute to strengthening resilience. Um, and if that's, if that's good enough for the Green Climate Fund, then I think um, 
topping up the social protection budget with climate finance is a good thing. But if it's, um, yeah, if it's us, these climate funds are asking social protection programs to have deliberate um, uh, measures to respond to climate hazards, then it could be a bit more problematic because I think it would it risks diverting attention away from from the core objectives of social protection. Tracy, did you want to uh, add any thoughts to that? Uh, to add to the financing, uh, the adaptive social protection, the discussion has been that the funds are usually not enough for social protection. Mm -hmm. And then we're talking about climate change. And one of the solutions where the climate funds could be useful is to align the two. And if you're doing climate risk management, then you have a program that is addressing adaptation, then that is combined with the social protection support to have one coherent program, then that would really be useful. Because usually when you look at the transfers that are distributed, it's really not enough. It's always like $12 or 15, and then there's very little money to invest in adaptation. So it takes a lot of innovative finance to be able to combine it and have a strong adaptive program. Mm. So that's why I see the value of um, merging climate finance and social protection finance. And, and Sheikh, I just wanted from your perspective, where your work is more on informal uh, mechanisms of um, social support, uh, how you see those can be enabled or supported by outside actors, or, or can they be? It depends. Uh, this, if you just look at the informal uh, ways of you know helping out people in need, uh, that can be facilitated and that can be financed by people not directly affected or from outside the affected community and those things are always i mean i don't know directly from other countries but in bangladesh um, especially students who are organized through student organizations uh, during large natural disasters actually help out people by collecting funds from informal sources, I mean, public mm. donations and other things. Mm. So this type of community initiatives from outside the affected community are always in action. And that's how actually people are surviving or coping. And just want to add one thing. I mean, we know these things are underfinanced, but at the same time, we also need to keep in mind, say mitigation, and adaptation both are important. So maybe we cannot really say uh, by compromising mitigation financing to adapt, uh, increase adaptation finance, uh, we probably should not uh, discuss in that way. We need more finance for both mitigation and adaptation. That's the ultimate mm -hmm. conclusion. Yes. So um, I think there are a cluster of interesting questions coming up uh, around um, how this affects the role of women within the household. So Megna is asking, has there been any evidence, anecdotal or otherwise, of an increase in gender-based violence through these types of programming? And what you, several of you have been talking about also brings me to mind around Sylvia Chant's work on the kind of increased responsabilization of, um, that women face through um, sometimes becoming targeted through these programs and, and what burdens that brings for them. So I wonder if panelists could reflect on um, what it means what, or what evidence we have around what it means for women's roles uh, and some of the potential negative impacts for women. Simon, would you like to start? Hmm. Negative Im impacts. I, I'd rather be talking about the positive impacts, of course, but um, we, we are doing some work in, in Northwest Tanzania, which is which is looking at um, how uh, it's 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 related to uh, to so social provision and to some extent social safety net provision, so health services for women and girls and how how those are how the effectiveness of that provision is affected both by climate risks and by gender based violence. Um, we we haven't haven't seen um, a link between um, increasing social provision and gender-based violence incidents. Um, the 
in fact, we've seen the reverse because the there, there have in the district where we were looking, um, there have been um, effective gender-based violence interventions going on simultaneously. Um, and I think that's the key. We need to be aware that uh, providing resources, be it for adaptation or for social protection or other things into, into communities where gender-based violence uh, and violence against women and, 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 and children is, is happening due to resource scarcity and resource uh, power of resources. We need to be aware that putting further resources into a situation like that can have negative consequences. And so we need to be doing things in, in parallel. So provision of resources and, and supporting women and men to come to terms with what it takes to get over gender-based violence. Mm. Jenna, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, so just along the same lines, I think uh, this highlights the importance of complementary measures um, to sensitize um, communities and also households uh, to make sure that there are no um, negative consequences for women. And some of the work that um, Simon uh, and I and Sam Barrett at IID have been involved in uh, in Ethiopia uh, looks a bit at that. So um, just recently I was in um, southern Ethiopia where there was an intervention around um, uh, helping women form self-help groups uh, and savings groups basically, but that was complemented with very deliberate um, uh, interventions to, to, to change power relations within, within households. Uh, in communities through um, what they call family dialogues and um, also engaging community leaders and so on. So just to highlight that. Thanks, Jenna. And I know Tracy had also raised her hand. Would you like to add? Uh, most of the issues have been mentioned, but uh, the question was about anecdotal evidence and I wanted to share the Uganda experience um, where cases of violence were reported by the women that were accessing cash transfers. And uh, the question was also asking how that can be addressed, which Jen and Simon have mentioned, the awareness raising. Uh, but for the case of uh, the embassy in Uganda, what they did, they had another program on gender-based violence uh, using the Uganda Women's Network. So they used that as a partner to support the social protection program as well, to extend the awareness and the interventions to target the same social protection beneficiaries. So the issue of targeting and for the different interventions usually helps. Even if the program itself doesn't have the skills, then we can build on others who are doing that kind of awareness to target the same people that are social protection beneficiaries. Yeah. Thanks. Now, um, what I'd like to do with the time we've got left is I see there's a cluster of questions um, that really pose some of the big issues. So I'm just going to um, mention those for us here and then I'm just going to ask each of the panellists to make a kind of concluding reflection on whichever of those questions is speaking most to them from the content of today. So mm. I've seen people raising questions about the the role of different actors. Some people are asking around, how can we make this sustainable with a public and the private role that might be needed to support? Um, others have talked about what is the role of government or the role of international climate finance. I think there's live questions there around who needs to come together and what are the barriers or opportunities in how they can see these um, adaptive social protection for climate resilience with a gender lens. And then I'm seeing a cluster of questions around, is there a trade-off around the urgency um, that we need to help people, uh, the poorest households and, and get social protection to them as soon as possible? Uh, and is there a trade-off there with making systems increasingly complex to deal with gender equality, uh, with climate? And how do we manage that perceived um, or not tension between um, moving ahead as fast as we can and, and building more and more complexity into the system? And I'm also seeing a cluster of questions around implementation. So how do we make sure that adding gender is not just a tick box exercise, given that many of the people implementing these schemes are already under huge time pressures uh, and the schemes themselves are, are sometimes hard to manage. So how can we make this a meaningful inclusion of gender and climate change uh, rather than something that just becomes 
you know, as we know, a, a formality. So I think some really meaty issues there, and we're not going to be able to have time to get into them. But I'd like to ask each of the panelists just to reflect on what speaks most to them from, from their work and to give us their concluding thoughts. So perhaps, Sheikh, should we start with you? So I guess uh, instead of calling uh, that, uh, naming it equality, maybe equity is more relevant here. I mean, that's necessarily the heart of our discussion today. Uh, making resources or helps or protection available to people who need it. And to make it sustainable, we, uh, especially for Bangladesh that we found, say, making formal financial institutions more accessible or equally accessible to women who actually bear huge financial burden because of exposure to climate change. And when this is the case, uh, targeting the women or targeting female-headed households is not really further complicating the thing. It's we better can call it, say, ensuring equity in the distribution of necessary resources. And yeah, that's all I just want to tell you. Yeah. Thanks, Sheikh. Um, Jana, would you like to go next? Um, so I quite like the questions around the trade-off between urgency and um, adding all kinds of new um, things to existing social protection programs. Um, so I think I'm in agreement about climate <laughs> um, and addressing climate hazards. I think, again, wants to emphasize the importance of um, ensuring that social protection programs is able, are able to do what they, they, they are meant to do. So their core poverty reduction, vulnerability reduction um, objectives. Um, and in that sense, I think it's really important to to um, address concerns, issues around gender inequality, because that's that's when you're talking about structural inequalities. And these types of structural inequalities just are exacerbated by climate change, by, by crises, by disasters. Um, so I think it's not a trade-off if you're thinking about gender equality issues. I think thinking of gender equality from the outset is, um, will be beneficial uh, during, at, at all times, really. Thanks, Jana. Uh, Simon, should we come to you? One of the reasons why I decided a few years ago to, to switch from moving almost com totally on climate adaptation to, to learn about gender equality was because um, I do believe that there's a certain sequence uh, and synchrony of things that need to happen um, if we're going to achieve the sort of the developmental outcomes that we're, that we're seeking both in the short and in, and in the medium to long term. Um, I think that, um, well, certainly from a personal perspective, uh, until we get gender equality up front and center into um, all of the policy, all of the array of policy instruments that we're trying to use to eradicate poverty, then we will um, we will be walking on one leg, um, and and uh, we really need to be walking on as many legs as we ha as we have, and to get those going in the same direction. So, um, whilst there are trade-offs between. Um, uh, uh, what might, might be considered to be community level resilience um, and um, uh, uh, other 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 uh, developmental outcomes. I, I think that, for, for, from a personal perspective, I think that gender equality um, is something that uh, is 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 so central and is such a driver of all other outcomes unless we achieve SDG five and all the other related gender equality outcomes that we're that we that are being put forward, then we're really not going to be moving very moving very far forward. There's a, there's some really interesting work which looks at um, the time it would take at current growth um, 
uh, distribution of growth uh, benefits uh, to achieve uh, a $1.25 uh, poverty uh, line and eradication, and that's um, with and uh, without gender equality um, uh, me measures incorporated in that. And one is obviously infinite, and the other is it, it, it brings it into something that is bring, bringing in gender equality measures, brings it makes it makes things feasible so um for me that's the you know if it is a trade-off then uh things trading things off against gender equality in my, in my view even if it's climate resilience um is isn't isn't a trade-off i would choose choose to make and i don't think it's i don't i think it's a trade-off against the global public good that we shouldn't be trading things off against thanks simon okay tracy over to you for our concluding words. Thanks, Susanna. Um, I would also really agree with the previous speakers and say that uh, when we talk about gender equality or equity, we are talking about people, actually, men, women, boys, girls, and all the programs that we work for, we say we are working for the people, the poor people, and they're all into that word. When we're looking at gender, we're looking at everybody in there. So if we say we want trade-offs because we want to quickly do programs and finish them and technically do them right, then we're not really addressing the people's issues. Uh, and the social movements now have a very famous saying that nothing for us without us. And I think they are very right because we claim that we are doing everything to address their needs. So the trade-off may be important for us as development workers, but it's not important for those that we are working for. For me, I value a process that may take a little bit longer, but is than rushing it quickly and then we finish it. And then the question was talking about the time that is needed to support the programs. When we're talking about how social protection can be transformative, I agree with Melko who asked the question that transformation cannot happen in one year or two years. That's why the donors and uh, the implementers and policy makers, we need to focus on longer term trajectories of funding and programming so that we're able to really have a comprehensive process that addresses these issues. But also lastly, to say that uh, in social protection, we have programs focusing on livelihoods where we can really take time to have a well-designed program. But if it's emergency, then definitely it's difficult to do that. So we also need to contextualize, but definitely those gender equality and cannot be compromised. It's important that we need proper programming that takes into account policy practice to be able to see that transformation. Great, thanks Tracy. So we are coming up to the end of the webinar. So it just leaves for me to say thank you very much for all of our panelists for your insights, um, your presentations, and thank you very much for everybody who's joined us remotely. You've provoked lots of interesting questions and reflections and I've seen lots of discussion going on in the chat that I think will be really interesting for IID to look at and to think about in the context of all this work. So thank you very much for all of that thinking and thank you also for your questions which I think have just opened up some of the issues um, that we can start to think about. Um, so I think um, IID would definitely be interested in hearing if, if there'd be an appetite to go explore some of these issues in more detail um, in other, other forums or other types of uh, online sharing. Um, and just to let you all know that we'll be sharing the webinar um, by email to all of you who've registered. Um, and uh, you'll also be able to find the emails of the panelists here. So if there are any specific questions that we haven't managed to get up to, then please do follow up with them. So thank you very much everyone for joining and um, hope you enjoyed the session. <laughs>